Hey everyone, it's Maggie Bot, and today we are going to start on our adventure of my favorite games from last year, so the best games of 2017, according to Maggie Bot. This doesn't include the about 20 or so that came out in 2017 that I still have not gotten to play, including things like Outlive and Noria and a few others I think I would absolutely like. But of the games that I have played, there are definitely tons that I want to show to you. So we're going to go through my top 40, no less. So there's not... There's not a dearth of them, let me just tell you. Um, there was enough for me to almost break this into sections of Euro games, party games, but I just figured let's rank them all, let's talk about them all, because there's some really fun ones in here. And um, if you have any other questions, or if you'd like to hear about another specific game, let me know down in the comments below. Uh, let's get rolling. Uh, number 40 is Riga. Riga is from Stefan Rishaus. Uh, published by Ostia Spiele. Uh, this was uh, kind of a surprise little card game. It's got Stefan Risthouse's name on it. He did art great, so it was kind of an auto buy for me. But um, the card game is not quite what you expect from someone that did something like Arkwright, which is so big and bold, and Gantis, which is so Euro. This is just a sweet and simple set collection game. So in the game you are drawing cards and you're drawing them in like that fabulous way where you draw any one pile of, of cards and those piles are kind of put out until they reach a certain value. And it's just a it's a really slick way to do these kind of set collection games. So you, you draw cards and you draw projects. And what you're trying to do is build projects to get points and you're also doing a little bit of set collection with those um, because you have kind of secret goals. And in the game... Uh, each project values the different resources you could have drawn in a different manner. So this project might give you $5 for every yellow resource spent, but this one might only give you three. So you're using those resources, trying to use them on the best projects for them. Um, the downside of this, and the one thing I'll warn you about, it's a little bit longer than you think it's going to be. It is closer to that 50 minutes hour um, for people that haven't played much. And if you don't include the advanced variant cards uh, with the game, you might run out of cards in a four player game. So that's just something to look out for. Uh, but it's just sweet and simple and cheap. And I think it just needed a little bit of a pick me up. Uh, number 39 is Topiary. Uh, this is a two four player game uh, from designer Danny Devine. And it was originally published by Fever Games, and that's how I played it, because my friend Suze had a copy, and we brought it to this um, summit thing, and we were playing it at the airport, and um, then later, Renegade Game Studios actually picked it up, and they rejiggered a couple of the meeples, but kept the gameplay exactly the same. So that's one thing that is kind of unique about these new ones. I hadn't seen them until March of this year, because I went to Granite Game Summit and played it, but they made... Um, Little inclusivity meeples. Uh, so the game you're at this uh, topiary park. I don't know what you call these parks. I, uh, but you're looking at all the beautiful topiary that's been made, and there's dinosaurs and elephants and spirals and giant cones. And what you want to do is be able to see as many um, of these topiary as you can. So they have to get uh, ascending order. So if I can see a very very tall one, I'm not going to be able to see anything behind it. So every turn you're laying tiles down and putting out a little meeple and at the end of the game you're going to score for everything that meeple can see. But the trick is that other people can put tiles in front of your meeples that will kind of tower over the things behind them and prevent you from seeing them at the end. And so it's a, a slightly mean game because you are trying to put all of these tiles out that will block your opponents but you still want to see your nice long strings of topiaries that will match if you can see three different dinosaurs that's fabulous because you get extra points um so i do think it's a really fun game uh very light very simple and if it's in a nice small box it's just perfect little con game i would say uh next is photosynthesis it's actually kind of reminds me of topiary this is the only time you're gonna see standees on this list i can almost guarantee it i didn't check before i said those words but i just kind of generally dislike standees and 
on any occasion. Uh, photosynthesis is sort of like topiary where you are trying to get your trees in the path of the sun to get out all those sunlight points to use for actions because all the sun you soak up gives you access to actions. Uh, so the sun rotates around the board so you have to be kind of smart in the way that you choose to put down your trees and how big they are um, and where they're where they're germinating. A uh, really fun little action selection game, just gorgeous art, kind of a big box. You wouldn't expect how big this game is until you really see it in person. It's it's bigger than like a fantasy flight box. Um, but it's it's lovely. It's a little bit long and very, very sinky. But what I like about photosynthesis is I think it's sold to kind of your every gamer, your lighter gamers, your gateway gamers, even though it's a little more thinky, a little more abstract than what they would normally do. It's just so approachable with those big trees and the beautiful art that I think people didn't notice quite how deep that strategy would get. Uh, number 37 is Anachrony. Uh, this is from Mind Clash Games and Mind Clash does these big, crazy Kickstarter edition versions of these games. Anachrony is no uh, exception to that. It is a work placement game with kind of a neat little loan system. So the way that you take a loan in this game is that your future self goes back in time and kind of cre creates something to pay off whatever you needed in your in your current age. So when you get to the future, you need to then go back and kind of pay yourself <laughs> for whatever you borrowed. Um, I call it a loan because that's how in my brain it worked and it helped me with my strategies. Uh, Anachrony also had the benefit of uh, when it was on Kickstarter, they made these like three inch mechs like minis and you put your little engineers in them and you'd send them out to the board they were completely unnecessary for gameplay but they were gorgeous um i did end up backing this game i played it a few times i think it's great and then i um sold it to a friend of mine who wanted to play it solo um, because i just think for me the reason this game is a little bit lower on the list is that it's a little complicated to set up and tear down and it has a lot of moving parts for not that deep of a strategy. So it's a little bit long and complicated for a game that, you know, is is more in my mind in the, like the depths of Waterdeep or so. So I, I just think it's, it was just a little bit much for what it was offering, but a really fun game and very inventive and very beautiful. And there's lots of different ways of playing. I only ended up playing two of those ways, but there were like four or five different ones designed. I just, you need the same game group or you need to play solo in order to make those types of things a benefit for you. And that for me, that's just not a thing that I get to do very often. Number 36 is a friend of mine. This is Gil Hovis game Wordsy. Uh, it's a one to six player word game. It takes about 20 minutes. It's a party game. Uh, it's just it's just good, clean fun, everyone. If you like long words, which I do, I, I'm a vocabulary nerd. I just like word games. None of my friends like them. You don't like them. No one likes word games, but just a few of us. Me and Gil and a couple others. Uh, Wordsy is fantastic, though. Uh, what I like about it is that you can use any word you want. So if you really enjoy complicated or long words or you just have a really good vocabulary, this game is going to be no big deal for you because you get cards in your hand and you play as many of them as you can, but you can use any letters within your word that you like. You could use seven E's because you don't need the cards for every letter that you're using. You're just going to get points based on which cards you do end up using. Um, the other fabulous thing is that you can kind of try before you buy this game because he set up this fabulous tweet bot called Wordsybot. And so you can go on Twitter and play with Wordsybot to get a sense of the game. And, um, I found that really fun. Sometimes when I'm awake and it's late at night and someone else is up and playing with Wordsybot, we've had some fun trying to compete and do that. Uh, so it really neat and a just nice small form factor for a party game, really easy to tote around. Number 35. So this one's a little bit special. We're gonna, we're gonna take a moment with this one. Uh, this is Aura from Breaking Games. This was designed by a guy named Michael Orion. Um, it says two to four players on the box. I've only played it two and I'm only going to suggest it at two. I think it is a amazing two player game, but I've read through the multiplayer rules and I don't think that they're for me and I don't think that they're gonna enhance the parts of the game I think are genius. And I do put this in genius. Um, Aura is a uh, it's kind of a break the line game, kind of like a battle line or arena or any of those two player games where you're trying to fight each other head to head, but with a lane based combat. And so me, is it my turn? I get to place out 
cards, two to five cards, and I'm trying to attack my opponent. And then they can play cards down to um, to block as much as they like. So uh, what's cool about the cards is that there are colors on the front and back, and then numbers on just the part that you as the player can see. So your opponent knows what colors of cards you're playing, and all the colors have a relationship to each other. So white begets blue, begets green, begets yellow, however that circle works. But uh, you know that like any yellow card can beat any white card. And so when you see the cards come down in your attack, you can kind of plan for some of your blocking, but there's always surprises on the front. And uh, what you're really trying to do is just break through the line in one part and then have matching values that can kind of pile on. So no matter what got blocked, if I get a five through and I have three other fives, I can put all four of them through and make you discard four cards. And the game is all about discards. So it's just a really neat game full of feints and bluffing and psychology and just some a little bit of luck, but not a terrible amount of luck uh, because you do have a lot of uh, control over what you're playing and how many cards you're playing at a time. And one of the best rules I love about it, so everyone has a hand of cards, um, if I attack and you block all of my attack, I get the ability to attack again. So I can kind of draw some of the cards out of your hand and then hit you for the whammy, whatever I was setting up before. And that leads to me putting my whammy in first so that they don't expect it. And it just, it has this really beautiful back and forth. So um, lastly, sorry, I, I actually messaged Michael online because I, I'd never heard of the guy. I've never met him. And I didn't really know anything about the game. A friend of mine convinced me to play it at a trade show. I think it was... ACD or no it was Alliance last year um he works for breaking games and he thought I would really like this game and I was not convinced by the name or anything because normally Aura would tell you it's going to be more of like a Dixit kind of like the lighter friendlier game but this is a very serious two-player game uh I think uh so what what the design inspiration he says is that it's the manipulation of key energy uh, it's something he follows in his life. Um, so he says it's only something you would recognize if you're familiar with the Qigong practice. So the five colors represent the five elements and are directly inspired um, the different trump colors that are used in the game. Um, he said that he didn't think many people would pick up on this, uh, but they would notice that the sacred geometry art was used. And so sacred geometry art also kind of looks like vector art. So it's got this really nice sparse thing to it. I think his slight downfall here and why you probably haven't heard of this game is that um, he had an intent of appealing to the broadest audience from younger kids to parents or even grandparents. Um, he wanted an approachable gateway style card game that would appeal to both gamers and non-gamers alike. And I don't think that that's what this game is. I think he misjudged his audience a little bit because what this game is for are highly competitive card nerds. If you're an MTG player or a net runner player and you wanted something cool and abstract to play in between rounds or with your partner, I think this is the way to go. I think this game is so full of intrigue and bluffing that it's it, it'd be hard for me as a kind of more competitive player to play it with someone who wanted this to be a light, approachable game. I think it's too mean for that. That being said, the rules are not complicated, so yes, he's correct in that. But he does have a competitive CCG background, is what he said. Uh, so he did create that feel of a CCG very, very well. This is this feels like a really good magic match to me, um, but just less complex uh, rules-wise. Um, he also noted that if you like this design, his next design is going to be more thematic, and I, I don't really care, but sure, go ahead. Uh, it was neat to talk with him a little bit over Board Game Geek. Um, it's not the first time I've sent a designer a message, so it might sound a little weird, but sometimes you just gotta know what's going on. Um, okay, that's enough about Aura, but I do think it's really good. It will be in my collection for a very long time, despite not really knowing anyone who plays it. <laughs> uh, number 34 is Majesty for the Realm. This is a Z-Man game for Marc-Andre. Uh, he is known for Splendor. <laughs> Lots of money there. 
so Majesty for the Realm is another two to four player game, lasts 20 to 40 minutes, so it's right in his wheelhouse. In this one, it's a set collection game again, but it's a very different style of set collection game because um, in it, you're going to select a card every round and add it to your set. And every time you add it to your set, you're going to set off <laughs> set off. You're going to activate a power to get money or meeples, and those powers get bigger or more complicated every time you add a card to that same set. The way you pay for the cards is similar to Century Spice Road, where if you want the one on the end, it's free, but for every time you skip a card, you need to leave a meeple behind, and you have a limited number of meeples. So it's a meeple management game with a set collection aspect to it. And it has both kind of an intro mode and you can flip the cards over to get more complicated powers out of them later. And I just thought this was such a swell little gateway game and just such a perfect follow up to Splendor. It really is a good one for him to have come out with. Um, I have noticed that not a lot of stores picked it up. Um, a couple times I've been in a board game store and not seen it. And I've definitely suggested to the person behind the desk, whether or not that happens. Is, I mean, it's very rare that you're actually speaking with the person that placed the order for stuff, but I figure spread the word when you can. <laughs> Number 33 is the Castles of Burgundy dice game. Um, this is the one to five player roll and rate version of the Castles of Burgundy. Uh, Castles of Burgundy, uh, you are building out farms and, and castles and towns and all that stuff. And so in this, in the roll and write version, you're also doing that. You roll one set of dice in the middle. It's two numbers and two colors. And then every player that's playing chooses from the same dice available. So maybe I want the six green and someone else takes the same six, but they use the yellow and then someone else takes the three in the yellow. So you can use any two dice you like, as long as one's a number, one's a color. And you are kind of using the same abilities as you would use in Base Castle of the Burgundy. So um, I have found this is way easier to teach someone um, who has played Castle of the Burgundy before because all of the powers make more sense. Someone who hasn't played Castle of the Burgundy takes a little bit more explanation. So that is kind of my downside to this game is that it's a lot of explanation if they've not played castles before. Um, this design was credited with Stefan Feld and Christophe Toussaint. And I would imagine Kristoff came along and did the roll and write version and they're just crediting Stefan Feld with uh, Castle's rules, but I don't actually know. I couldn't find that online. Um, but it's just really nice and you can play with as many players as you have around the table as long as they can see the dice they can play. And so you, uh, we played like a 12 player game at Shucks at one point. We had everyone around the same table in the little bar. Uh, number 32 is Startups. This is a three to seven player game from Jun Sasaki, the, the guy behind Oink Games. Uh, it is definitely an Oink game. It is $20 in that little sweet box, the cute little components. Um, this one's a little bit harder to get into. It took me like, I played it once, kind of figured out how to play it and then didn't play it again for months. Played it again, had forgotten completely how to play it and did very poorly. And then as soon as I played it a few times within the same month, um, it all kind of came alive again. So you're trying to be the owner of a startup by the end of the game to get points from other players. But during the game, if you control the most of a given startup, you can't uh, contribute to it anymore. So it's a lot of like keeping cards back and timing things well and trying to steal stuff from other people. Really fun Hard to explain without playing it, but it was, it's definitely of my favorite of the Oink games that's come out in a while, though I haven't played a lot of Insider, which I would assume is probably really good too. And lastly for today, we have Bali. Uh, so Bali is a remake of a game called Rapa Nui uh, that did not come out to the States ever. The uh, White Goblin Games remade it and brought it here. Um, it's two to four players in 45 minutes. Um, it is a set collection game. It's just light and sweet and lovely. You're picking up all these tropical fruits and trying to kind of uh, put them on this altar thing. Um, just as sweet and light and lovely as you could want in a game. So it, it definitely passed by a lot of the reviewers and stuff like that. I don't think it got a lot of uh, attention this time around, but um, it's worth uh, a look. You can play it online as Rapa Nui, not as Bali. Uh, and I really like that you could just spend the day playing these beautiful island games. If you'd like, you can play some Bora Bora and some Bali. <laughs> you, could, you could just spend a whole day on these beautiful tropical islands. 
Alrighty, so we are done with the first 10 um, of the top 40 for 2017. Um, if there's anything you'd like to comment on, please leave comments below. Uh, if you have questions or anything, um, one honorable mention that will not appear on the top 40 because I don't quite know how to rank it yet is Feudum. I've played it since building these slides and then um, it is a fabulous little area control game where you're kind of moving a pawn around a board, but the real, the, the, the reason the game is, um, good, uh, is that the game's economy is this kind of outside of the board. You have to control guilds, push the things through each of the different guild houses. Um, and I have not met a person that didn't either love this game or think it's so not worth the time. Um, I've actually gotten some hate around this game from some folks that I know. Uh, so it's kind of fun to have such a div div divisive game. Uh, but uh, I do have to make a quick mention at the end of my videos nowadays. I work for a company called PSI. We work in correspondence and directly with a lot of publishers. PSI works with a lot of publishers, so some of the games that I mentioned in my videos are definitely involved in my day job, but they don't pay for me to do review. They don't talk to me about this. I don't consult with them at all, and none of the copies that I have are gifts um, for reviews. Sometimes I get things through other means, but most of the time, about 90% of my games I pay for with my little debit card. Uh, so uh, if you think that I am biased. I totally am, but I like to think that I like what I like and everyone knows that. So I, I just want to put these little little things into the ends, but um, if you don't care for that, if you don't like that I work for a game industry company, then please by all means find another reviewer. There's some amazing humans out there that don't work in the industry. Um, I just happen to love this so much that I do it for my day job and my hobby and my creative outlet. So games for everything. Um, if you have anything else, please leave it in the comments below. Um, I should have the next video up in about a week. Thanks. Bye.